Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody, for turning up today. Um, it's great, great to have a, a, a crowd to speak to. Um, this is my knowledge sem seminar, and the title is Spot the Difference, Morphometric Measurements and Distinctive Pelvic Fin Markings Are Successful in Distinguishing Between the Similar Australian Black Tip Shark and the Common Black Tip Shark. Um, my name's Grant Johnson, and I've, uh, I'm a fishery scientist here in the department, and I've been in that role for the last seven years. Now we've got one fishery in the Northern Territory that actively targets sharks and that's the offshore net line fishery. And today I'm going to speak about a project that we've been undertaking for the last couple of years, um, the results of which have some pretty significant consequences for the ongoing probability and sustainability of this fishery. So the key message I think about that comes out of this project and and I'd like everyone to keep in mind as we as we move through this presentation today is effective fisheries management relies on good information. Now it's worth just breaking this down a little bit, um, breaking this statement down a little bit. And effective fisheries management has two really important components to it. And the first is the fish themselves. To be effective in your management, you don't want to overfish the fishery and you don't want to damage the ecosystem in which those fish live. And that's pretty pretty intuitive sort of sort of a concept. The other and probably not so intuitive part of that concept is you want to be able to harvest a resource at a rate where people are able to go out there and have make make profit and be make make a living from harvesting that resource. And that and in doing that they um, they provide a they play a very important service in that they, they provide food for, for all of us in the community. So there's two roles there and it's a really fine line between getting the balance right between not taking enough and taking too many. So to have any, any hope of, of achieving this goal, effective uh, fisheries management relies on knowing firstly what species you're catching, how much of that species you're catching and the biology of that species. Pretty. Pretty simple things, but often, often these these concepts are a little bit harder to to um, the information on these concepts is a little bit harder to get than what you may think. And in the case of the offshore net, net line fishery, fishery, we have a really interesting situation where one of the key target species is actually two different species that look the same, uh, so much the same that fishery scientists aren't out on the boats aren't able to distinguish between the two species. And despite, they, despite them looking so similar, they have very, very different biological traits. So the aim of our project was to, was to, to go out there and try and discover a way that we can easily, cost effectively and quickly be able to distinguish between these two species. So just a, um, just a bit of an overview of my presentation today. I'll go into a bit of background about why this is such a um, why this is such an important problem. Um, this will involve a bit of a description about the offshore net and line fishery and a, a bit of a description about the two species of shark themselves. Um, I'll go into a bit of detail about our approach to solving that problem and, and I'll talk about the results of, of our investigations and try and sum it up by um, tying it all together by describing what it means, what, how it will change the way we do things out in the field. Now, to understand this story completely, you need to go back a fair way. And in this case, you need to go back to the 1970s when North Australia was subject to a, a large scale industrial Taiwanese fishery. Now, these were pretty serious boats. Um, most of them were over 30 metres in length. And at their peak, there was up to 67 of these boats operating off the North Australian coast. They used um, you know, between 8 and 20 kilometres of net and were catching up to 25,000 tonnes per year. Now, fair proportion, 25,000 tonnes was all different pelagic species, but a fair proportion of that was black tip sharks. Um, in 1986, um, the, the Australian government, uh, under a bit of pressure because of the bycatch of these Taiwanese vessels, and also under a little bit of pressure uh, from a desire to want to establish an Australian domestic fishery targeting these pelagic uh, resources, reduced the amount of allowable amount of net to two and a half kilometres. And this, combined with some um, pretty serious falling catch rates, effectively made the Taiwanese unviable and, and they left. Now, at this point in time, it was pretty clear from, from decreasing catch per unit effort of these boats and also from 
decreasing um, in a decrease in the average size of, of the fish being caught by this fishery that that a number of northern northern pelagic species, including the black tip shark, are under um, pretty serious pressure pressure and showing all the signs of being overexploited. Yep, just to um, just to graphically illustrate the extent of the Taiwanese fishing, this this graph here is the catches of black tip shark in that period from 19, uh, 1974 through to 1986. And you can see that they are an order of magnitude and this, this line here, which is the catches of um, the offshore net and line fishery from that period on. Now these reduced catches have allowed the, the stocks to recover and, and one of the legacies of this high period of, um, high period of fishing was that uh, there was a research uh, was in, initiated into, into northern, northern stocks of pelagic species, including the black tip shark. Now, one of the profound discoveries of, of this research up there was that one of the um, observers working on these Taiwanese boats noticed that every now and then he'd come across a black tip shark which was immature at a, a size well above where it should have been mature. And um, it's, it's one, of the, one of the great things of science that sometimes small observations like that can lead to quite profound discoveries. So they investigated this a bit further and they, they came, they, they found that these two black tip sharks actually differed in a number of other ways which included the number of um, pre-caudal vertebrae that they had and they also done a genetic analysis and discovered that they were actually two separate species. Now what they did as part of this research also was sort of have a look at how common this second species of black tip shark was. And they found that it wasn't all that common. You know, it was roughly there was roughly one of these other species of black tip shark for every 300 of the other uh, for every 300 of the 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 one the normal black tip shark. So we fast forward to today, and we have the offshore net and line fishery, which is out targeting these these pelagic fish resources. Now, the offshore net and line um, fisheries permitted the fish from the coastline out to the AFZ. There's 14 licences in this fishery, but for various reasons, there's usually only between four and six operators. Uh, they're permitted to use pelagic gill net and longline gear, um, and they're managed by effort control. So they're managed, which are pretty pretty tight. So they're restricted in the amount of restricted in the amount of gear that they can use, and they're also restricted in the number of days that they're able to go fishing. Now the fisheries value is 3.76 million, which places it in the in the top four or five most important fisheries in the Northern Territory. Now in the offshore net and line fishery, uh, they target primarily um, about a third of the catch is various shark species. Another third is grey is grey mackerel. But what we're really interested in here today is this portion of the catch, which is the black tip black tip catch. Now this is now we know that this is comprised of two, two different species. However, initially it was thought that the second species at a ratio of 300 to 1 was pretty, pretty uncommon. And it wasn't until 2007, um, on the result of some stock structure genetic work, um, that they discovered that, they made this startling discovery that actually it wasn't 300 to 1, that they found a ratio of 5 to 1 between these two species. So instead of comprising a very small percentage of that catch, the second species it actually comprise a very significant chunk. So this sends some alarm bells ringing through management because here we have a whole third of the offshore net line fisheries catch is actually comprised of two different species, two different species which have very, very different biological, biological traits. So what these two species are, we have the Australian black tip shark, which is Carcharhinus pilsoni and the common black tip shark, which is Carcharhinus lombardus. Now if you look at the distributions of these two species, the uh, Australian black tip shark, Tilsoni, uh, it occurs around northern Australia, it's an Australian endemic species, while the common black tip shark occurs in, in temperate uh, tropical waters right around the world. Now the area we're really interested in as part of this talk is where they co-occur around northern Australia. And when you look at, at the known biological traits of both of these species, you find, find that there's some really distinct differences. The common black tip shark, um, Limbardus, grows significantly bigger, it breeds less often, 
and it's, it's quite a bit larger and older at its size and maturity. So there's very, very, even though these animals look so similar, there's some really, really distinct biological differences between the two. Now, the differences in size and maturity give us one clue on how we can distinguish between these two species. And as you will see, this is a graph of the um, size of, of blacktip, both species of blacktip, in the offshore net and line fishery. This line here is the size and maturity of uh, Tilstoni. This line here is the size and maturity of Limbardus. Limbardus. So in this size range here, when we, when we see animals in this size range here, we know that if it's immature and it's above 115 centimetres but below 180 centimetres, then it's Limbardus. If it's above 115 centimetres it's, it's, and mature, it's Tilstoni. However, as you can see, that only comprises a pretty small proportion of the catch, about roughly 40%. So even though the differences in maturity can be used to distinguish between the two species, the species, there's a whole section of the catch which still remains impossible to determine between the two. So it doesn't, doesn't matter um, that we don't know the difference between these two species. Some, some would argue that we can manage them together, but there's been a quite a, quite a prolonged call, I guess, in the scientific community that, that these two species are different enough that they need to be managed separately. Now, Jenny Overton um, initially raised raised this point in one of in, in her paper um, that she said that there's an urgent need to learn more about there's an urgent need to learn more about uh, Limbardus and that the first step in learning more about Limbardus is actually to be able to identify which is Limbardus and which is Tilsonite. A second paper last year released by um, Alistair Harry again looked at the repercussions reproductive ecology of both species and found that there's really, really significant differences between the two and that they, needed to be, that they needed to be managed at a species level because of these differences were so pronounced. Because most likely Limbardus was less resilient to, to fishing and um, reacted differently to fishing than, than, than Tilsonite. And finally, just last week, this paper came out. Now this paper um, a part of it was a, a mark recapture study on the offshore net and line fishery. And as part of that, they, they modelled, modelled the effects of, of different harvest rates on the rate of change in the population. And what their models indicated was, was this pretty pronounced statement. Our models indicate that the more sea Lombardus is represented in the catches, the lower the harvest rate the combined population can tolerate. Thus, there is a clear need to monitor relative proportions of the two species within the black tip shark catch and manage their harvest rates accordingly. Very clear that these two species differ enough that they need to be managed separately. separately. And the first step to being able to do that is to be able to tell the two species apart. So what do we do? To tackle, to tackle this problem, first out we went out and purchased um, a number of sharks from, from fishermen operating in the offshore net line. This, this sample of sharks included a, a big range of sizes and sexes and they were collected off the major fishing grounds in the offshore net and line fishery which is on the west coast here and also off the north, um, north coast, north of Manangrida. For each one of those samples we got out our ruler and tape measure and collected 85 different, different measurements from each shark. We also, we also took extensive uh, number of photos documented, documenting each, each specimen. We extracted, extracted the vertebrae and did vertebrae counts for each specimen um, and we also took genetic samples and sent them off for, for identification. So, Now one of the known ways to distinguish between the two species is the pre-caudal pre vertebrae count. Now this is not a, anyone who saw me in the lab trying to uh, get these these counts knows that it's not a very easy, not a, certainly not an effective way to distinguish between the two species in the field. But that, that there is a significant difference between the two species and with the um, Tilston eye having a much lower pre vertebrae count than the common black tip shark. And when you graph the, um, the pre vertebrae counts of 
the specimens in my sample, you see this distinct grouping. Here you have Kilstonite, and here you have Limbardus. And so it neatly separates the two groups and can be used as a, as a way of IDing between the two specimens. So in our sample, we ended up with 92 um, Tilsonite and 17 Lombardus, uh, 17 Lombardus. So next thing that we did was to send some genetic, genetic samples away for identification. And this turned up a pretty interesting result. We, we ended up with 72 Australian black tips Tilsonite, 13 Lombardus, and we ended up with 27 hybrids. So this is this is pretty pretty significant result in that quarter of, of quarter of the specimens in my sample are actually hybrids. Now, it's it raises a few it raises a few questions. Um, it, the two, it's not unexpected in that the two species are known to hybrid across other parts of their range, but it was the first time that we've actually collected them in the major fishing areas of the offshore net and line fishery. And essentially that fills the gap in right across the whole range of Australia, these two species are producing hybrids. The effect of that though is, is something that we need to look at in a lot more detail. If the hybrids are not as fit as the two parent populations, or if the hybrids are infertile, obviously if, if they're off, if they're 25% of the population, as my sample might might indicate then that's got some pretty profound effects for how the productivity of the stock. Now we had a bit of a quick look exploring this, um, ex exploring this to see how fit these, these hybrids in my sample were. And what we found out was that 23 of the hybrids had the vertebrae count of Tilsonite, four of the hybrids had the vertebrae count of the of Limbardus. And what seemed to be happening was that they were following the reproductive trends of the of what the vertebrae identification would, would imply. So Tilson and I were maturing at a smaller size, anything above 115 centimetres was mature. And similarly with Limbardus, anything over 180 centimetres was mature, however anything below 180 centimetres was immature. So they seem to be following these trends. And also what was interesting is that eight, eight of our um, Tilsonite hybrids had, had near full-term pups in them. So that indicates that they're, they're being reasonably successful in, in reproducing and at least in part contributing to, um, contributing to the population. So we, had, we got out all this morphometric morphometric data and now it's time to sit down and crunch and see if we can find a way that we might be able to distinguish between the two species with a single measurement. Now we used machine, the first technique we used was machine learning. Now to summarise what machine learning is, it takes, takes an, a known set, set of inputs, in our case that's all our morphological measurements, and matches that up against um, a known set of outputs, in our case that's our species, and then builds a model which, which allows you to predict, predict which species that which species they are for any new data that you may, may that you may input into that model. So to get to that stage that of using machine learning technique, we had to satisfy a few assumptions. And the first thing is, is that we had to account for variability. In, in the actual length of the animal, caused by the actual size of the animals. Um, of course, you know, a larger animal is going to have larger pelvic fins and larger pectoral fins than a smaller animal. So to do that, and so as you can see there, that's the variability and that's caused by the size of the animal alone. So we divided by, by fork length, which removes that, that level of variability or variability caused by, by just the size alone. So the second, never, second assumption is that uh, for the machine learning technique is that the data the data displays normal distribution. So we tested that and um, trans transformed transformed using the power rule to any data that wasn't normally distributed. We inspected it and um, in this case we've got one one data point here which has got a large degree of variance so we weren't able to see these so in, just to inspect it we removed that one.
and we were able to, to check that all the data had normal, normal transfer at normal distributions. Any data, having 85 different morphological um, or, or variables, we had, the, we had the luxury that we were able to, able to remove any that didn't, didn't conform. So we removed any data that was non-normal. And then the second, another assumption of, of the model is that um, all the data, the data has the same, has the same variance. So we, we, we standardised for that. And then we used a MATLAB feature selection to create, um, to identify those, those variables which contributed most to the, the variation, to the variation in, in the sample. And after we'd done that, we found, identified these seven variables were, were the ones that contributed most and were most important in distinguishing between the two species. We inputted this into the uh, machine learning method and it produced a model which predicted the species and we tested that model against some, some new data and we were able to achieve 100% accuracy. Now that's all quite a complex, you know, quite a complex process and um, I'd, I'd hope to be the one out in the boat trying to get my calculator out and distinguish between the two species. So what we were able to do was simplify it um, by making a standalone program that can be that can be installed on any computer. So the interface looks something like this. And it's just a matter of collecting those measurements out in the field, entering them into it, and pressing the magic button, and it'll give you an indication of what species or a prediction of what species it is based on those measurements. So our second crack at looking at, at a way of being able to distinguish these two species was discriminant function analysis. Now it, we followed the same steps um, in, in, in preparing the data for discriminant function analysis and then we ran the disc discriminant function analysis using the, those variables that we identified as being most important and it left us with five, it left us a model which used five different measurements. However, that, those, those, the results of that when we tested that data tested that model against some new data was that we only achieved 75% accuracy. So that's still not too bad, certainly better than what we've been going at the moment, being able to distinguish these two species, but not certainly not as good as the machine learning technique. And again, we're able to develop a program which can be installed on any computer where you input those five measurements and it'll give you a prediction of what species, um, what species it was. Now the third thing we did, the third method we did, was we had a look at the black markings on the, on the pelvic fins of these animals. Now this is interesting because this was one of the original methods when they did the original work in the early 1980s of distinguishing between the two species. But subsequent genetic um, studies have sort of thrown a bit of doubt on it being reliable. Now what we wanted to do is we wanted to revisit this and just have a look because obviously if you can turn the fish over and see it's got black markings, that's a good way of um, being able to distinguish them quickly and easily out in the field. So to have a look at this, we, we took the photos of the pelvic fins as such. Um, we included a scale, which is um, my tag there, which was a known measurement, so we could calibrate the measuring programs on the computer. Um, we measured the area of the pelvic fin, and then we measured the area of the black mark, and then expressed that area of the black mark as a percentage of the total pelvic fin. Um, we also had a close look at the edges of the mark and classified them whether they were diffuse or whether they were distinct. And the, result, the results that we found was if the black mark on the pelvic fin is distinct, distinct and greater than 3% 3, 3 of the total area, then the species was the common black tip shark. There was no black marking or the marking was less than 3%, then the species is the Australian. Um, Australian black tip shark kills tonight. And this, worked, this pretty simple method worked out to be pretty successful in 96% of the cases. So it was able to distinguish, in our sample, it was able to distinguish all but three, three, of, of, three of the samples correctly. So here now we, we're starting to get a bit of a toolbox of ways that we can distinguish between the two species. We had the maturity at the start, however, it's a bit uh, limited in it and only relates to about 40% of the catch, which you can determine this way. We have the machine learning technique, which was able to predict correctly 100% of the um, 
of the identifications. A discriminant function analysis, which wasn't quite as successful, and also had the pelvic fin marking. So what that leaves us with is we've got a bit of a toolbox when we go out into the field and try and distinguish between these two species. We've got various ways that we can we can identify between the two species, and that gives us multiple lines of evidence and helps us to shore up, be sure around our so be certain around our identifications. Now, like most great things that happen in, in the lab in front of a computer, there's always that thing of um, there's always that aspect of how practical they will be out when you're out in the water trying to identify between these two species. Now certainly taking seven seven additional measurements for every black tip shark may or may not be applicable. Um, in certain situations I can see it's applicable and I guess it comes down to balancing just how important it is to get your catch the catch composition of these right. And if it's you know if that's the number one priority when, when you're out on boats and collecting this information then certainly seven measurements is not that onerous. But may may forfeit some of the other work that you're required to do out there. The photos would be quick, simple and all it would be as a matter of taking a photo photo of the pelvic fins with a unique specimen um, ID on there and then you can sit down and analyse that at your, at your leisure and, and make an identification on, based on that. The biggest danger uh, with the photo technique is um, seeing your camera being washed off into the water over the side which, uh, which can happen all too easily. But all of a sudden we've, we've got a bit of a toolbox where we can go out into the field and we can try all these methods and see if they work. So where do we go from here? Well obviously is to take it out into the field and just see how practical these methods are. Um, we're quite lucky in that uh, there's been a published paper that documents how bad we are at distinguishing between these two species. So we've got something that we can compare, compare ourselves against and see if we can improve and, and you know, really, really shore up our, our, um, our estimates of what, what the, the, the split of these two species. Um, Another, another interesting point is that, that particularly, uh, particularly markings are quite variable uh, between, between regions. So there's, I, I guess this, this result needs to be taken in caution in that while we've found it within our sample to be applicable, it probably needs to be carefully tested before you take it to other regions and try. But at least we've got a, a technique and a, um, a method which would allow other regions to possibly test these to see if they work or find new sets of measurements which may work for them in their particular areas. Um, probably one of the key areas that we need to spend a bit of time on um, is distinguishing if we can use this data to distinguish between the hybrids um, in the sample and also to get a bit of a firmer understanding of what just what is the implications to the stock of having this high level of hybrids between the two species. So there's plenty, plenty to keep us busy over the next few years. So just tying it all up, effective fisheries management relies on good information. You need to be able to tell what species is you're catching. What we've been able to achieve in this project is we've been able to get three new methods to distinguish between the two, two, two species. That in turn will, um, that in turn you can take out in the field and use as a multifaceted approach to identify between the two species and that in turn will help us better estimate what the proportion of those two species are in the catch and that in turn will help us be more, more sure around our, our modelling and, and determine whether our current catch rates are sustainable. So I'd just like to uh, thank my co-investigators, Hock, Hock, Rick and, and Clive. Um, I'd like to thank my friends and colleagues here at NT Fisheries and, and from around Australia. Um, one of, one of the most important things I think you can do is um, talk and discuss, discuss things and, and certainly we're all standing on the backs of, of giants in information and it's great to be able to have an exchange of ideas and it certainly enriches any, any project that you're part of. Um, I'd like to thank the department for its use of its funding for funding and use of its resources and also I'd like to thank my long suffering family, my wife Rachel and my daughter Michaela who um, sacrifice uh, some of their time with me while well, I've had a crack at doing this, this project. So at that point I would just like to open 
open to any discussion or any questions. I'll try and answer.